Uh, Susie Flores is our speaker tonight and she's a kelp farmer. Uh, she and her husband run one of the largest commercial seaweed farms in Connecticut and it's called Stonington Kelp Company. They started their venture in 2016 and they sell food grade sugar kelp to many local restaurants and shops. And I just wanted to give you a quote from Green Wave, which is an organization that offers training to ocean farmers, talking about Susie and the company. Regenerative ocean farming is a new industry and women have emerged as leaders at every level. Connecticut farmer Susie Flores is one of them. For Susie, regenerative ocean farming is a cooperative movement rather than a competitive one with a focus on new business values like restoring the planet and nurturing local communities, including her own family. Susie is introducing regenerative ocean crops to her local community through multiple channels. She's given presentations about her farm at places like the Florence Griswold Museum and many other organizations. So I just want you to please join me in welcoming Susie Flores. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm going to try and figure out how to share my screen, but I just wanted to say that I'm really grateful to be here tonight. And thank you to Diane and Karen for all the pre-work leading up to this. Um, and um, as you heard, I own and operate a, I mean, I call it a small sugar kelp farm, but it actually is the largest commercial ocean farm, uh, sugar kelp farm, I should say, outside of the state of Maine. Um, but as my mom says, that and $1.50 will get you right on the bus because there just aren't that many of us out here. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, oh, and let's see if I have to figure out how to advance the slides. There we go. So kelp um, and specifically sugar kelp, which is uh, what we're growing is algae. Um, it's the same seaweed that you find washed up on local beaches. In fact, I can pretty much guarantee that you have seen this seaweed at some point in your life uh, on a local beach. It's one of the fastest growing organisms on earth. It grows, the sugar kelp grows between one and four centimeters a day, which is close to an inch and an inch and a half on its best day. And that's really the season where we're going into right now. There's the, the seaweed just goes through gigantic growth spurts every day. Um, and it's really a crop that's best cultivated in winter in our area. So the growing season for me is from November to June. I usually kind of earmark it with uh, Thanksgiving is when I outplant and Memorial Day is when the farm is fully out of the water and I'm not really, uh, you know, we're not, we're not visiting the farm any longer. We're kind of just cleaning the gear and dealing with stabilized product. And the reason that I grow sugar kelp is because it is the only seaweed that I can grow legally in the state of Connecticut for food consumption. But there are many other edible seaweeds that do grow naturally in our region. Um, sugar kelp is also known as Atlantic kombu. Uh, it is, uh, its um, Latin name is Saccharina latissima. And it's the Long Island Sound's characteristic long brown seaweed. It is morphologically plastic, which means it's going to take on the uh, characteristics of its growing site. And so in this picture here, you have a nice breakdown of a standard kelp blade. In the wild, sugar kelp attaches itself to, oh, here, my, my slides want me to speak a little faster than I'm speaking. So in the wild, the kelp attaches itself to rocks and other substrates with this, the long round kind of stem-like structure on the left-hand side of the photo, which is called the holdfast. And unlike terrestrial plants that have roots and get their nutrition from the soil, the holdfast is really just an anchor. It, it doesn't deliver any nutrition whatsoever to the, um, to the actual blade of kelp. The water column is where all the nutrition comes from. It needs water uh, and it needs sunlight to grow. The holdfast is attached to a stipe, which looks a lot like the stem. Um, but it, again, you know, since it's not delivering any nutrition, it functions a little bit differently than terrestrial plants stems do. Uh, the stipes are edible. They are very crunchy. They're very delicious. They are the fan favorite of all of my children. We harvest them at the end of the year and they're a really fabulous item to pickle. They, they remind me a lot of dilly beans, if you've ever had those. And then you have the actual blade. 
um, this is the part that I think most of the local chefs get really excited about. And our uh, farm site usually has an average seasonal growth of blades that are around um, anywhere between eight and I'd say 12 feet. Uh, the blade actually, it, it grows out of the meristem, which is the part of the tissue that is closest to the stipe and it will regenerate. So if I cut the seaweed, um, you know, about a quarter down the blade in the beginning of April, the seaweed will continue growing until I take the whole um, farm out of the water. So it's flat in the middle, it is roughly on the edges and the ruffling is really just a way to optimize the current flow and the nutrient delivery um, in those lower energy environments. So areas that don't have as much energy tend to have more ruffling. Um, or it can be very smooth and narrow, which is a way to minimize drag in the high energy environments. And where we farm out in the Fishers Island Sound is extremely high energy. So the seaweed that we grow tends to be very long and very narrow. And I think it looks a lot like a very, very long lasagna noodle. And then in the middle here, you can see there's kind of a darker, there's a darker coloration to it. And that brown stripe is what's known as the sorus tissue. And that's the reproductive tissue of the seaweed. So the um, sorus tissue will be something that starts to become evident on my seaweed at my farm in May, as the waters start to warm up and the seaweed wants to procreate. So this is actually a photo from um, my harvest a year ago. And you can see kind of the light ruffling on the edges and you can see a little bit of the sorus tissue starting to come through. Um, and you can also just get a sense. This is basically as wide as the seaweed on my farm ever will grow. Um, so this relationship of cultivating seaweed uh, has been taking place for many, many years in Asia, but it was very unstable. The Japanese began cultivating nori in the 1600s. And for a few reasons, including a series of typhoons, um, in 1948, the nori seaweed beds were completely decimated. And at this time, farmers knew very little about the life cycle of the seaweeds. And so the industry as a whole tanked. And this is a little tidbit that my husband and I really love. Seaweed at this time used to be referred to as gambler's grass because the business was so risky due to the unpredictable nature of the actual uh, um, sporing process for the seaweed. Um, currently, Jay and I, when we're out planting, we're contending with weather and we're contending with uh, water quality. Um, and we're you know, worried about creating a market for our seaweed after it grows, but the actual ability to get the seaweed spores to grow is not something that we have to worry about. So uh, on the screen here, you have um, someone who I was very excited to learn about when I started seaweed farming. This is Kathleen, Dr. Kathleen Drew Baker, and she was a phycologist, which is a seaweed doctor. I also learned that as I started seaweed farming. Um, and she discovered a special phase in the life cycle of this uh, North Wales and East Ireland coastline seaweed that was known as lava. And lava is a relative of nori, which, had, which was what was growing in Japan. She discovered specifically that in the life circle of lava, there's a stage where the lava is a worm-like um, al alga and it bores into seashells. And so understanding this phase of life allowed scientists in Japan to introduce oyster shells into the nori farming process. And that since has stabilized uh, the nori farming industry. So it, just another way that seaweed and oysters, I think, pair well together in addition to eating them. Um, and actually in Japan, uh, Dr. Kathleen Drew Baker has become known as the mother of the sea. And every year, April 14th, there's a huge celebration in her honor. And um, this is a monument to her that was erected in the 60s um, where uh, she's pictured here. And she actually never set foot in Japan. And so I think that that's even more amazing that she's celebrated, but she's truly just this kind of person who exists on another continent. Um, so, you know, all of that hard work that she did flash forward to, to Stonington Kelp Company. And this is, this is an image of our farm. Uh, the little orange box in the bottom left-hand corner is actually where we are located. We, our farm exists underwater on a 10 acre site in the Fishers Island Sound. We're right at the Connecticut, Rhode Island and New York uh, water borders. We're over a sandy bottom area. We have an average depth of uh, 25 feet. Um, more or less. 
Uh, and we are located in an approved aquaculture site. And we share the space with a lot of um, commercial fishermen. And I'm not sure if you know this, but Stonington, Connecticut is home to um, Connecticut's last commercial fishing fleet. The, the site that we have, as I mentioned, it's an approved aquaculture site and it's available for lease. So we do not own it. We merely lease the right to cultivate seaweed there in a set time frame. And so our set time frame for our farm lease is um, from November 1st to uh, June 1st. Um, and this is an aerial shot of what the farm, what a seaweed farm looks like from the surface. And uh, from where we sit, it really doesn't look like very much. Um, from the surface, you can see navigational buoys, you can uh, kind of get a sense of the perimeter of the farm. But most of the action that's actually happening on our seaweed farm is uh, taking place underwater. And, and this, is, this is a very rudimentary drawing of what that underwater action would look like. The seaweed is growing on a line that is suspended about three to five feet below the surface. And as I mentioned before, the seaweed is going to grow from um, the nutrition in the water as well as from access to sunlight, which is why we don't suspend that line any deeper. It also allows us to access the boat or access the seaweed line from the boat. Um, so we don't have to dive for our seaweed. We just roll you know, the boat up alongside the line. We use a boat hook, um, stick it into the water, pull the line up, and then we can expect, inspect the seaweed uh, to measure the rates of growth and just make sure everything is progressing how we would actually like it to progress. Um, and this is another uh, rendering of the seaweed farm um, that a local artist did. Um, our, our farm site has a current that moves between two and three knots on average. So I love this picture. I think it's very beautiful and kind of gives you like a perspective of what the farm is like. But in actuality, the seaweed is always horizontal. It's always getting pulled in one direction or the other, much like a flag blowing in the wind. And that strong current is something that really contributes to the nutrient delivery of the seaweed and its growth rates. Um, it also makes our site a little bit more dangerous than other sites that are out there, but it, you know, it's really all about balance. We make an effort to um, pay close attention to the weather and the wind uh, and tend to the farm in pairs rather than doing it by ourselves. So it is, it is a trade-off to some degree. Um, this is what it actually looks like. So you'll notice in this picture that the seaweed is flowing along in the current. This is, um, again, this is a photo that was taken at the very end of our harvest season last year. Um, you can see the stipes kind of sticking up out of the water, almost like a buzz cut. And that's from a uh, area of the line where I had already harvested the seaweed. And then um, in the water, you can see all of the seaweed that is that was remaining for us to kind of pull out. Last year, we did have a lot of extra crop because of COVID, um, a lot of our uh, restaurant partners and um, school partners were shut down. Um, but you, you can see kind of just from this image as well that the seaweed really never sits down. Um, and I think, I think this, per this picture in particular looks a lot like mermaid hair. And it, I never tire of kind of coming along the lines and seeing this site. Uh, this, is, this is a photograph that was actually taken by uh, someone who helps me out on the farm who also happens to be a, um, a, a photographer. She was a Fulbright scholar and then got grounded when they closed the borders. So she was, she was stuck with me out on the boat all, all winter. So it was really worked out wonderfully for me. Um, hopefully she gets to finish her work down the line. So you can see here, the blades are quite long. I would say that these were probably around 12 feet. Um, they do not start out that way. We are uh, out planting our seaweed and we use something called seed string. When we're out planting the seed string onto our farm, each little kelp blade is just about one millimeter long and very, very delicate. Um, so as I mentioned, we don't actually plant the seaweed out in the ocean the way that you would plant a terrestrial crop. We take uh, already established kelp, which is growing on seed string, and we place it out in the ocean to continue to grow. We could, the process is called out planting and the seed string comes from a licensed hatchery to control the species of seaweed that is being grown. As I said, sugar kelp in the state of Connecticut is the only species that you're legally allowed to cultivate for human consumption. Um, it also, 
helps regulate that nothing invasive or non-native is being grown in our area. I get my seed from Green Wave, uh, which is a nonprofit dedicated to developing blue economies. Um, they are, uh, in, this, in this photo, you can see one of their directors and me kind of pulling a very fuzzy looking seed string out of the, the um, container. And that, that is the one millimeter, one millimeter long sugar kelp blades. And the whole process is fairly, fairly simple. Um, we do need calm winds. Uh, we need the water and air temperatures to be ideal. The water temperature needs to be under 58 degrees, but the air temperature needs to be over 40 degrees, ideally. Um, and for my site, I need the wind to be at five knots uh, or less. And you know, we're hoping that the gusts are also going to be low. Um, and you really need that calm water because you're handling a whole bunch of lime as well as that very delicate baby kelp seed string. So the spool that you see in this picture is, it, the spool itself is a PVC pipe with 250 feet of kite string wrapped tightly around it. And the, the kelp is actually growing on that kite string. The baby kelp on the seed string comes from wild kelp that's harvested usually in September uh, from an area that's actually not far from our farm site. The wild kelp samples are collected uh, when they have a ton of sores tissue presented on them. Um, and then Green Wave, in this instance, takes that wild kelp sample back to the hatchery and they induce sporing. Um, and so they're, they're basically kind of fast forwarding the whole uh, sporification process. Uh, so Green Wave will keep the spores in their hatchery for about six weeks. They're giving it the right light, the right nutrients. Um, the right temperature, they're making sure that the ocean water that, you know, they have filtered ocean water in there to keep any, you know, bad stuff from growing. And it helps everything move along more quickly during this very delicate stage. And then that allows me to outplant in November, having uh, a, a better jumping off point. I'm having, uh, and then I can have a longer growing season. So it really allows for maximum yield the way that they operate their hatchery. Um, and so the whole process I think is just absolutely amazing. And I'll show you if we can get it to work, a little video. So my job is you can see in this picture, my um, I'm putting the half inch line through the PVC spool string. And then what I'm going to do is splice that little half inch line. Uh, uh, I'm going to splice the kite string into that little half inch line um, and tie it in. <laughs> the world's best knot because I really don't want that to come untangled. Um, and then I reattach that half inch line back to the mooring side. And all right, let's see if this works. The video. So, and then once it's spliced, we just kind of motor along and you can see I allow the line to unfurl here. And this is called a, a rope method of cultivating seaweed. It uses zero input. So I don't use any fresh water. Um, I do not use any fertilizer. I don't use any arable land. It doesn't push any pressure on uh, land-based resources. The seaweed grows without any interference by me. I'm, I like to joke and say that it, that it grows in spite of any interference by me. Um, and it, it's, it's quite simple and it comes from a, a long line of very smart people um, who learned a lot about the life cycle of seaweed, such as Dr. Baker, or like made efforts to kind of improve the hatchery process, such as Dr. Charlie Yarish out of Yukon, um, as well as the very adept hatchery managers at Green Wave. Um, so I directly benefit from uh, a lot of hard work from a lot of other people. And I am very, very grateful for everything that they have done. All right, so let's see if I can move this along. Okay, um, another aspect of the uh, sugar kelp farming that I, I find absolutely wonderful is the way that it interacts with the ecosystem. So the kelp grows on its own using nutrients found naturally in the water, but I, I use the term kind of naturally loosely because it is humans that put off a lot of the nitrogen um, through fertilizer runoff and animal waste. Um, and the excess nitrogen in the water can cause uh, algal blooms, it can impact uh, the dissolved oxygen levels in the water, and it can, um, it can increase ocean acidification. So the seaweed is actually presents a really great benefit for our local waterways. 
I live, excuse me, I live near the little Narragansett Bay and we have a lot of uh, the Platophora, which is a type of algae that blooms um, in early spring and can mat and down uh, and choke out um, eelgrass. And so that excess nitrogen in the water, if it got sucked up by uh, a crop such as seaweed that could be used in another way would be a really big benefit. Um, so the season that sugar kelp grows is when a lot of the other algaes are dormant. So everything that my farm, you know, is absorbing from the ocean, um, it is it absorbs before, you know, one of the other more dangerous algaes can get to it. Uh, we also absorb carbon from the water, much like plants absorb carbon from the air, and this can slow the rate of ocean acidification. And kelp and seaweeds in general, they absorb carbon five times faster than terrestrial plants, which makes sense when you think about how fast they grow. Um, and there's also some research that shows that certain seaweeds when fed to cows reduce the amount of methane in their burps, which is uh, absolutely amazing when you think about how much livestock is out there and how, the, how much livestock contributes to greenhouse gases each year. And it is also probably the fact that my children love the most about seaweed. Unfortunately, it is not the seaweed that we cultivate, but it is still fun uh, nevertheless. And our kelp farm also creates a little habitat for fish in the local waterways. And anecdotally, I, I have noticed um, that there's much more bird activity around our farm. Uh, I think it's because of the um, food sources that are just available around our seaweed. We've also noticed, this is the first year we've noticed this, um, seals are swimming around the seaweed farm. So that's wildly excited, uh, exciting for us. Um, and you know that's really important to me just in general because as I mentioned, Stonington, Connecticut is home to one of the last commercial fishing fleets. So anything that I can do to better support the waters locally and help keep this important element of our economy going is you know something that I wanna, I wanna be a part of. And we do participate in research with um, various institutions each year to get a more precise approximation of the amount of carbon our farm is sequestering by analyzing both water samples and tissue samples over a series of, of farm years. So when we actually do get to harvest, which begins, you know, usually right around this time this year, um, uh, you know, so we have a six month growing season of just absorbing carbon and nitrogen and, and making a nice little place for fish to swim, but then it's, it's time to, you know, bring the seaweed out of the water and um, give it to chefs and hungry people. And we really, the harvest season is determined first and foremost by um, the water temperature, by the way that the seaweed is looking, you know, like the, the color and the length and all of that, um, but really by the um, promise of a new home for it. So it's, it's really for me, I harvest to order. I will, uh, you know, if a chef calls me up and says I need 15 pounds, then I will go out and I will get them their 15 pounds. Um, I do try to accumulate my orders weekly from, you know, local chefs, breweries. Um, today I delivered to a, a guy who's making um, shoyu, uh, which is a, like a type of soy sauce with our seaweed. Um, and so I accumulate the orders uh, to just, you know, uh, keep it efficient. And it's very simple. It's it, it, We go along the line. Um, we lift the lines up like you can see in this picture and then we just simply cut the seaweed off and, and put the seaweed into a, um, you know, a food basket or a, a, a cooler and then we deliver it to where it needs to go. And that, I mean, that's really, that's really all it is. Um, and the industry currently in the United States compared to the, the global size of the industry is, it's pretty small. Um, like most seafood, over 90% of the seaweed consumed in the US is imported. However, we have ideal growing conditions. We have clean water. We can responsibly cultivate seaweed. I test my seaweed for heavy metal contamination every year, which is a requirement unique to the state of Connecticut. Um, and the seaweed does absorb everything from the water, both the good and the bad. So if you're getting imported seaweed from someplace without strict standards on how you grow, um, you are putting yourself at risk of consuming something like heavy metals um, by accident. Uh, it, in the US, we often manage seaweed farms the same way we manage oyster farms, which is 
in particular what they do in the state of Connecticut. Um, we, in addition to testing our seaweed every year for heavy metals, we also test for panels of bacteria as well. Um, because the seaweed season um, tends to end as the waters warm up, we're fortunate that we are not out there um, growing seaweed during a time when a lot of the really dangerous bacteria tend to bloom. Uh, I would, I would say that um, uh, supporting locally grown seaweed is it's obviously better for the environment. It's um, it's a great way to reduce our carbon footprint in this area, but. It also is an opportunity since we do have all of this clean coastline, we do have working waterfronts all along the New England, New England coast, coast. It's an opportunity where we have room to really develop um, a, new, a new seaweed economy. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to get going this year is uh, myself and a bunch of other, um, I say a bunch, the other two Connecticut seaweed farmers uh, we're, what we're working with a couple nonprofit organizations. Um, we're working with Connecticut Sea Grant. We're working with Southern Connecticut uh, uh, University, and we're working with um, uh, the Yellow Farmhouse to start a New England Kelp Harvest Week, where we're going to be partnering with local restaurants and breweries. Uh, we said from Westport to Westerly, but it turns out it's going to be from Greenwich up to Westerly, and have them feature locally cultivated sugar kelp on their food or drink menus um, just to kind of celebrate the Connecticut sugar kelp, sugar kelp harvest and get it on people's radar. It also gives people an opportunity to try seaweed outside of just a seaweed salad. So I, you know, this is a shameless plug, but I really do hope if you feel comfortable in doing so to um, visit the events page of my website and see, you can get a list of uh, restaurants that are participating in this event and it, it, you know, you can support them. It's gonna be uh, a great opportunity to kind of hit this trifecta where you can support a local farm, you can support local restaurants, um, you can support a new economy and you can also kind of, you can fight climate change just all in one meal and all you have to do is just eat delicious food. So um, there is my shameless plug. And we do have some really, I, I actually went to one of the restaurants um, that's participating for a meal the other night and it was pretty delightful. Um, but back to the seaweed economy, the global commercial seaweed market size is just under, um, in 2019, it was listed to be just under $6 billion and it's just anticipated to continue increasing. There's all of these developments in cultivating seaweed with um, interest in new markets like segments for applications. So animal feed is one of the big ones that people are looking into. Um, it's being considered more widely in agriculture as an organic input for, um, uh, for soil, um, as well as a pharmaceutical market is um, growing tremendously. And in the United States, actually, it's, um, it's growing fastest because of the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Um, I am most interested, though, uh, not in cultivating at uh, on a very, very large scale, because I think that that's just not practical for this region. But um, I'm most interested in growing that kind of highest standard of seaweed that we can eat that's going to bring the most nutrition and value to our diets. It's still going to have a very positive impact on the environment. Um, but it is, uh, you know, we're, we're growing food. So for me, getting seaweed onto more plates and helping it become a, a bigger part of our everyday diets is one of the exciting challenges that I have as a small farmer. Um, finding fresh seaweed outside of foraging, believe it or not, is really difficult. And sugar kelp does not really grow you know, much further west in the Long Island Sound, and it's not growing any further down the coast. So many of the chefs um, that I'm finding, they're looking for the flexibility to create these dishes that are what they call sea to table with seaweed that they know was grown sustainably. So they know it wasn't forged from an area where there could be some sort of contamination on the seaweed. Um, and they also uh, can, you know, they, they have that information, they have that data that says that the seaweed was tested, you know, for the following different um, contaminants and heavy metals. And I'm, Seeing, uh, I'm seeing this be a, a very growing sort of appetite, pun intended, that these chefs are having 
I also believe that as they learn more about how the choices they make by menu selection can have an impact on the environment, they're, they're working actively to, um, to make, make choices that they can stand by. Um, this, and I, I don't know if this is specific to New England. I am I am branching out a little bit more into the New York um, market, and and I am finding a lot of kind of the same mentality. But it's it, it, there's more plant based meals out there. People are working sustainability into the their the story of their menu, and they're thinking outside of just seaweed salads, which I am still a tremendous fan of. So um, you know, don't think I'm knocking seaweed salads. But you can see. Um, so these are just a couple images of dishes that were created uh, using our kelp. And um, the bottom left, Melissa Clark from the New York Times did a piece about seaweed. Um, and so that's her chicken with seaweed roasted potatoes. And the reason I think they're so excited about it beyond its uh, environmental benefits and the sustainable growth practices that we use is it has this fabulous umami quality like um, mushrooms or Parmesan cheese. And it really fascinates the chefs and it's so simple to use. Um, so the top three ways that people tend to cook with it are um, by blanching it and chopping it up to be whatever shape you want, you know, such as a noodle or, you know, the, the smaller shape that usually is used in seaweed salad, um, drying it, and then using it as a seasoning. Uh, that is a, a way that people tend to season stocks and broths using um, the dried concentrated sugar kelp as kind of an umami punch. Um, or by pureeing it. I, um, I sell a lot of seaweed in pureed frozen cube form and people will use that to put into their smoothies. In fact, on Easter, my mother is coming to visit me and she will be, she already put her order in for 100 cubes for her and my father for their smoothies. I hide it in chicken wings all the time uh, to make my kids eat more vegetables because it's very high in iron and calcium. Um, we put it in soups and stocks. Uh, any 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 chance I can sneak it into a salad when it's in season, I absolutely do. And it really is, at least for my family, I, I love incorporating it because it comes into harvest prior to when many other vegetables are available. And it has it just it's very high in calcium. It's very high in iron. Uh, it ha it's high in iodine, vitamins A, B6, lots of trace minerals that are difficult to find. It has folic acids, omegas, um, antioxidants. It's Right now being studied in the United States at UConn um, is one study that I know of to really get a better handle of the um, actual health benefits it has on humans. I think that um, sometimes you hear it may, you know, help with weight loss or it may reduce your risk of, you know, this, that and the other. Um, and I really do appreciate that people are looking into the actual impacts that it has. Uh, but with all of these nutrients and vitamins and minerals in it, you know that it's, it's, um, it's definitely better than for me what the alternative is, which is probably eating potato chips. Um, and if you're interested in cooking with seaweed, there are two wonderful resources that you can access. They're free and they're on my website. Um, they're downloadable P PDF cookbooks that share recipes designed specifically for Atlantic uh, sugar kelp. Um, and it's, it's only one of the one of the very many edible seaweeds that are out there um, and that can bring nutrition to your plate. Uh, and it, I mean, it, uh, it's a little grim, but because it's so sustainable and because it doesn't require any um, resources like fresh water or land, it's one of those foods that if we're not eating it now, we're definitely going to be eating it 10 years from now when um, when the pressure on those resources starts to make us rethink the way we approach food production. Um, but the wonderful thing about that is it's actually quite good. So um, I would encourage you to try it uh, in, in a smoothie, um, sprinkle some over your steak, make a compound butter, butter with dried seaweed, and, and just know that by making this small shift, adding a new ingredient into your uh, routine can have a tremendous benefit not only on the uh you know your health on a new connecticut based economy but also it has a really big impact on the environment um so you know definitely think about the harvest week as an opportunity to introduce yourself to some fabulous seaweed dishes 
and um, I am happy to answer any questions if, if you have them. If people have questions, just unmute yourself and, and ask, ask away. I have a question. Please ask. Can you, can you hear me? I can, I absolutely can. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, is, is the uh, number of uh, farming areas in that area limited to uh, X many so that uh, it, uh, it's, it's not all congested with that type of farming? Um, the way that they uh, regulate seaweed farming is it is you have to set your farm up in an approved aquaculture site. The permitting process probably took us around 18 months to get through. It involves um, partnering with the Army Corps of Engineers, the state, um, the uh, D Department of Aquaculture. Uh, and um, so by way of that uh, and by fear of any sort of gear issues, uh, there would not be another seaweed farm kind of right along our borders. Um, I did also learn recently in one of the research studies that we are a part of that the seaweed, there's only so much nitrogen and carbon in a certain concentrated area of water. So if there were say, you know, 18 seaweed farms all clustered in one region, there would really have to be a whole bunch of organic nitrogen in order for all of those farms right. to produce seaweed successfully. That, that's uh, similar to land farming if you overdo it. It's, uh, exactly. You, you yeah. ruin the soil. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. You know, I, I, my, if my memory serves me many, many, many years ago, my mother was from Northern Ireland, Donegal area. And I swear I can remember they used to eat uh, the seaweed, you know, it wasn't harvested. They just go out and pick it up and eat it. That's right. I, I don't know how they prepared it, but. Uh, um, there's a lot of different, um, when I was looking into the history, uh, the culinary history of seaweed for another um, program that I'm uh, participating in, I was really hard pressed to find anything in the, um, in the United States and the Northeast but I did come across a lot of different applications in England, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, <laughs> one of the things I heard in Ireland was it kind of fell out of fashion as an ingredient because it was considered peasant's food. So huh. uh, it was readily available to anybody. You can go and harvest it on the beach. It was very, very nutrient dense. Um, right. So uh, as you know, it, it became kind of a status symbol. So if you were eating seaweed, then it meant that you perhaps couldn't afford you know, other things at the market. So it did It did have kind of a falling out, but there are definitely Irish chefs out there who are trying to support the comeback of this yeah. ingredient. Very good. You don't have tours on your farm, do you? Where people can actually see it? We, this year we wanted to do a harvest your own, uh, much like people go to like an apple orchard or, a, you know, a blueberry farm. Um, with COVID, we think that we're going to have to kick it down the road another year. Uh, our yeah. kids still aren't back in school, so they're on the boat with us most of the time, and I think that it's just too much. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for Very coming. interesting. I'm going to have to try it. Yeah. <laughs> it looks good. I, I have a question. Um, I was on a trip to the um, North Atlantic part of, of Canada, New Brunswick area, and in their farmer's market, they had a, a booth with huge amounts of dried seaweed. Um, and, and would that be, what kind of, a, it was, I tasted it. It was very, very bitter tasting. Um, what, what kind of kelp or seaweed would that have been? There's, yeah, there, it, it could have been, it could have been uh, any variety of seaweed. The bitterness in flavor, um, if it was dried, Usually, it, that if it was a type of kelp, that could mean it was a kelp that has a higher iodine content. That tends to be that really bitter. Um, it kind of gets you on the side right away. Okay. What's interesting about um, kelp, uh, and uh, there's about 30, 33, I think, different species of kelp. 
is that once you uh, once you boil it, you're going to reduce the iodine content and wildly change the flavor. So what it tastes like fresh out of the ocean versus what it tastes like blanche is totally different. When they dry it, in a lot of instances, they're just pulling it from the ocean, throwing it right on a rack in the sun, and then that's the end of it. Because he was trying to convince me that people eat it there in Canada like potato chips. And I was thinking, ugh, it didn't <laughs> taste good to me. So, um, <laughs> We, we have a couple of questions in the chat room. Uh, somebody says, where can I purchase sugar kelp to cook with? Um, the, uh, the sugar kelp is currently, I'm trying to think like where the closest place is. We have it in Stonington. I participate in you know, a lot of the local farmers markets um, that are up here. There is another seaweed farmer. Uh, it is New England Sea Farms. His name is Jonathan McGee. He's a great guy. Um, he is also selling out of the Essex area. Um, and then both of us sell our seaweed through a new uh, company called Healthy Plan Eat. So instead of Planet, it's P-L-A-N-E-A-T. And Healthy Plan Eat has a variety of pop-ups in all different locations in Connecticut. Both of our seaweed is available through Healthy Plan Eat as well. Um, we have a farm stand always at our farm in Stonington and uh, we're working with a few markets locally in New London. I'm not sure if that's a help though. Healthy Plan Eat would probably be the easiest way to get your hands on some fresh sugar kelp. I, I, would, I would think that your business will pick up now that the restaurants are opening up more. I really hope so. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> There's another there's another question. I, uh, somebody said they missed the very beginning. Is sugar kelp the only or best edible kind? Um, sugar kelp is the only kind that you can cultivate in the state of Connecticut um, legally with a permit. You can wild harvest or forage very, there's, I think, 38 different seaweeds in uh, the Long Island Sound. There's a handbook that's available free online. It was written by Dr. Charlie Yarish out of Yukon. Some of them are edible, some of them are toxic. Definitely consult the handbook before you uh, start eating seaweed. And just be aware that unless you're harvesting it from a place where you know that it's growing and then you also are aware that that area is clean water where you would also eat maybe clams from that region, I, I wouldn't wanna, I wouldn't risk it. There are a ton of other edible seaweeds though that are um, grown up in Maine, uh, wild harvested up in Maine, uh, in you know Rhode Island and Massachusetts. It's, it's one of those, um, it's an underutilized food resource. There are certain seaweeds that are really high in protein and you know there are certain seaweeds that bring a you know, different uh, array of nutrition to the table. So it's, you know, sugar kelp is just kind of the gateway drug, if you will. <laughs> Do predators or seals eat your seaweed, eat your kelp when you when it's growing, or do you have to worry about that? No, I th there is a part of me deep. I know it doesn't make any sense, but I always think if I'm leaning over the side of the boat and futzing with the line, that I'm going to see a shark come by. <laughs> but there is, it, uh, we have seen seals on the site. They're not interested in the seaweed. They're interested in any of the fish that are hiding in the habitat that the seaweed creates. Um, the seaweed, sugar kelp actually grows year round in this area. Um, it's not, it, I, my cultivation period and the best time to grow it for food is from November to the end of May. That's because when the waters warm up, all of the uh, mussels and all of the shrimp, all of the small little crustaceans, they, they start, um, they just start exploding and, and trying to, you know, procreate and they'll cling to anything that they can grab onto. So they'll, they often cling to our lines it's not even the seaweed itself um but it just starts to kind of make the whole thing a big mucky mess and so at that point we usually divert anything that's still in the water to fertilizer use so we'll bring it to farms either out in montauk or back here near stonington um, and allow the farmers to use that as an organic soil input on their farm yeah. to help improve soil health without having to add additional chemical nitrogen which then runs off into the water and further contaminates the whole water table <clears throat> Any other questions? Good presentation. 
<laughs> oh, thank you. You couldn't see how nervous I was. <laughs> oh, you're doing great. I have a quick question for you, Susie. Thanks again for the presentation. All the info was really great. Um, I'm just wondering what inspired you to become a kelp farmer and um, like what research you did before you started? Um, probably not enough research, but, <laughs> but so my husband, my husband and I, um, we kind of uh, just pulled the plug on our lives in New Jersey. I was working in Manhattan and he had a, um, an, a job in Manhattan as well. And, and it just one day he was kind of like, I don't like it here. And I was like, okay, let's go somewhere else. <laughs> so we, we wound up moving up to New England and um, we, we bought an old marina that we began rehabbing. And in the process, uh, I had an environmental science background and I thought that it would be cool if we had a seaweed garden that we could use for our family since we had access to boats and we could go out and tend to it. And we would just use it as like, you know, something that we grew food for ourselves and maybe our neighbors. And then the more I researched it, the more I realized that was neither legal nor practical. Um, so uh, in the research process, we saw that this was a possible economic stream. And even if it was a failed business, we still would be offsetting carbon. And I tricked my husband into following <laughs> me on this mission um, because for me, I, I think that it really does support our other business, which is a marina and that we have a bait and tackle shop. So people, people need to want to fish in this area and people need to want to use the water recreationally. So anything we can do, even if it's just a small bit to kind of improve the water quality and uh, improve the, um, the fisheries locally, then, you know, I, I got away with it. It allowed him to be on boats also all winter long. So I think that that helped. But Green Wave was, a, Green Wave was an invaluable resource for me for setting up our farm. Um, they are run by amazing, intelligent people. Uh, like I, I can't say enough great things about them. And I'm really sad that I haven't been able to see them since COVID has kind of kept everybody on their team landlocked. So it's a bummer. But they are, if you, if you are interested or um, they're a nonprofit, so... Uh, uh, you know, they're usually willing to talk. They have a, a lot of events, you know, where you can go and rub elbows and have a glass of wine and then donate money. <laughs> <laughs> Not to take away from the friends of the library, though. That's the first place to donate. Great. Yeah. <laughs> friends of the library as well. There is another question from someone in the chat. They want to know if severe storms uh, affect your kelp farm. Do they ever affect your kelp farm? They, um, they, they can affect the kelp farm, but uh, they're supposed to have the uh, converse, inverse converse effect. They're supposed to, they're actually, kelp farms can actually protect um, oyster farms or, uh, you know, clam uh, farms from storm surges because they serve as a buffer. So the, the biggest impact a severe storm would have on my farm is the high winds causing some sort of gear failure. Um, and that would not be ideal for me. But uh, the idea is that the seaweed itself can prevent a hurricane barrier for uh, coastal regions. So it's just another another small benefit that the seaweed can present. In fact, this year I, I planted an additional line of seaweed, not knowing for sure if I'd even have the market for it. But I did realize that the, the, if I farm, we only farm four acres of our 10 acre site. Um, last year I only farmed three. And I realized that if I farm four, the whole farm will do a little bit better because it's kind of protecting itself from each directional wind change. And, you know, hopefully that continues to prove out. We have some wind coming up. Okay. Uh, hi, um, you mentioned you'd love to see the seaweed industry grow locally. And I guess I'm wondering what people like us can do to help and maybe just hurdles or, or challenges in front of growing that industry? Um, I would really love to see the seaweed industry grow, but I say that with like a big giant, you know, but cautiously and responsibly. Um, I think that having clusters of seaweed farmers, like small clusters of seaweed farmers in various different spots where they're each uplifting their own community. Uh, I think the idea, the model where a lot of um, fishermen, existing fishermen can add this as a revenue stream. Uh, nobody's going to, nobody's going to hit it really, you know, nobody's going to hit it rich with a seaweed farm. 
but um, so having that, having seaweed be responsibly cultivated, uh, I, I do think also the state of Connecticut does a very good job because they, they are, they regulate us very heavily. They regulate us just like we're sea, we're fish, you know, any other fishery and um, it's really all for the best. And uh, you know, they're, they're not mean about it. I think they just do a great job. Um, in terms of uh, like my local community, I think that my biggest ask is that people just give it a shot. Um, and if they do, if they are someone that finds themselves dining out um, and they see seaweed on the menu asking where it actually comes from and if it's imported or they have no idea, then suggesting perhaps that they use some of the locally cultivated stuff. Um, I've, it, it, for, for me, it really starts with, you know, people, people wanting it. There has to be kind of that drive. So if there's seaweed in something and you know it's grown locally, buy it. I don't care if it's mine or John's or, you know, uh, DJ King's out of Brantford or, you know, Green Wave also has a farm. They tend to not sell um, commercially as much, but if people are getting used to seeing it on menus and trying it and, you know, feeding it to their kids and cooking with it, it doesn't seem so scary, then it gives us a chance, a fight and chance. And can, you, can you order the products online through your homepage as well? Is that what you said? You can you can order the, some of them online, the dried, the dried. Yeah, so the, the dried stuff, the stable stuff, um, the fresh seaweed, just because of cold chain shipping uh, yeah. expenses is, is a little bit harder. Um, uh, but the dried stuff can be ordered online. And if you do find yourself with fresh seaweed, it lasts in the fridge from, you know, like from ocean to, um, from when it comes out of the ocean, you have about a week of it in the refrigerator, kind of like if you had any other fresh vegetable. So it's not, it's, it can survive. And then what's very nice about it is, you know, if you hit that seven day or eight day mark and you realize you can't get to it, you just dry it or you throw it in your freezer and then you can kind of use it indefinitely. So it is something that um, it gives you a lot of options. Maybe I missed it, but how many uh, farms are there in Connecticut? In Connecticut uh, this year, growing and actually selling, there is just a hand, there's uh, I think five of us. Wow. Yeah, there's not that many. Um, it's, it's really good fun, but it's not something that uh, with the current demand is something that I think can be people's only revenue stream and so it's really trying to to tap into that special kind of person so for us we have the marina the seaweed season mm -hmm. works out really well but other you know like for fishermen i kind of always go towards that or maybe oyster farmers um they they have like kind of a unique opportunity where this is something they can slip into pretty easily um in new york there's about 17 farms that are being uh used as research sites this year None of them are allowed to commercially sell, unfortunately, um, because New York hasn't figured out how they want to regulate seaweed, but they, they do have, uh, all along Long Island, they do have a bunch of farmers that are kind of joining the ranks. And then there's, um, I think, two in Rhode Island and uh, two in Massachusetts, and then everybody else is up in Maine. Huh. 